praise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand tribes. It's shouting time in heaven. A sinner once lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven. Salvation has been brought down. The one in the end who brought the um. You were talking about getting excited. I get, I get excited every time I open the Bible, especially to study it. Um, but uh, I really get excited when I, when I open James to study it. And uh, I just couldn't wait to get here tonight to, to start on this. We probably, of course, we never do get very far, but we probably won't get real far into this. I'm going to give us a very slight introduction. Uh, I've said before, I, I'm not... I'm not too keen on geography things and things like that. I want to get into what the Holy Spirit inspired so he can work on us. But sometimes geography, uh, various other things that uh, go on at that time, uh, at the time when it was written, they are important. Uh, the one most important thing, I guess, is that we understand before we start to study James, uh, why the wet, why the letter was written? That way, as we go through it, it will answer a lot of questions for us. And the thing that always amazes me: the same problems they had, we have. And the boy that works for me now, we were talking about this today. That isn't it amazing? That those God is treating today through the ancient word the same problems they had. That, and I, well, I told him, I said, well, and he knew it. He, I said, that's because God knows everything. He knew we would have it. But to write something this old uh, and have it be good for us today, too, is, is just absolutely great. It shows us the magnificence of our God. It shows us the work of God's mind through the Holy Spirit here uh, helping us. Okay, let me just get right into it. Uh, it's written by James. Now, in Hebrew, James means Jacob. Okay, uh, Jesus was James half brother in the flesh. Now I say that because they both had the same mother but they did not both have the same father. Uh, Jesus' father was God in heaven and James' father was Joseph on the earth as were his other brothers and his sisters. Now the Catholic Church contends that uh, Mary was, a I think the word is perpetual virgin. She had Jesus and then she had no other children. And the Bible plainly points out that that just is not the case. Uh, so we know he had brothers and he had sisters. Uh, we don't know much about some of them. James, uh, we know a lot about James. Uh, James was quite a, quite a man. In fact, uh, history legend, which is as true as you want it to be, I guess. Uh, I want this to be true. Legend tells us that they called James uh, camel knees, that his, he was on his knees in prayer so much that his knees were callous like a camel that gets up and down on his knees all the time. And when we, when we read here, the characteristics of James and all the things that he said and did, uh, that, that sounds like more than a legend to me. But uh, I want to mention that it's just a letter, legend. To whom, doesn't that sound good? To whom, we didn't learn that at Aurora, did we, Bonnie? Yeah, I did. Mrs. Smith beat me in the head. I wonder what happened to her. I guess she's dead. Oh, I'm sure. She's old, but I have. Miss, Miss, Miss Rolfe was my favorite. I, she kind of mothered over me, and I just really, she made me a librarian and gave me motherly advice, and 
just she was I, I really like oh well, I really like Mrs. Smith too but I gave her a lot of trouble uh, to whom written to the 12 tribes scripture calls it of the dispersion now dispersion means just what it sounds like disperse scattering scattering to the 12 tribes of the scattering now remember what happened when Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, brought all that havoc on the church, out grabbing them, putting them in prison, and having them killed, and all of those things, it was so fierce that the Christians, except for the Apostles, had to flee Jerusalem. Of course, I see this as part of God's plan, as part of God's providence. I'm not saying He made it happen, but He knew it was going to, He allowed it to happen. So the gospel could be presented to all points of the earth as those people were scattered and told people and told people and told people. Uh, so we're, God's getting the word done there from something, something that was hard on the church. God uses. He does the same thing with us. If it's hard on us, God is going to use it. If we will let him, he will use it for his Glory. Now, that might say, I'm like, well, who's God? He thinks he can do it for his glory. Listen, he can do it for his glory, but that wasn't the only reason. People would be saved, and that would be to his glory, and that's, that's what God is all about. Uh, Twelve tribes of the dispersion. These would have been Christian Jews, more than likely Jewish Christians from the church in Jerusalem, led by James, the writer of the book, and chased out by the persecution of Saul, could also include some Gentile Christians. So we've got some Jewish Christians and some Gentile Christians being written to. Excuse me. <coughs> oh my, I don't know if that's ever going to leave. Why was it written? Now, this is the one really important thing here. Why was it written? To instruct them in the faith and to insulate them from all worldly temptation, to tell them how to live a Christian life and how to deal with social issues. It's what we're up against all the time. Do I do this? Do I do that? Can I go here? Can I go there? You know, what, what, what am I going to do? Uh, uh, I think with a strong Christian, those things, uh, those things are in his mind all the time. Uh, we ought to be, we ought, hi Debbie, we ought to be thinking, uh, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? That's what James is, is telling us here, what Jesus would do. Uh, it's commonly called, and this is why I get excited with it, I think, it's commonly called... The Gospel of Common Sense. Now, we just came out of a common sense book in Proverbs. Uh, James is so wise in writing this. They call it the Gospel of Common Sense. Now, of course, what James wrote, he wrote through inspiration of the Spirit. But still, he wrote in his own words. Uh, I think something... I know something that James is going to answer here. Uh, so many people today, and maybe you've had this question sometime or another. Why do good, why do bad things, <laughs> excuse me, I don't know where it went. That was a bad thing. Bonnie, I think I can write, I've got the insides of it yet. Did you see it? Thank you. Uh, Robert, go to a commercial, would you? Maybe that's it. I think he never wants it done. Okay, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that have come to Christ, and they were that seed 
that was planted on the path. They didn't last. They could have, but they didn't. And I think this is one of the reasons why. I had a young man, I baptized him one night. Later on that night, he got terrible appendicitis. He made up his mind that God didn't do him any good. He quit. As far as I know, he's never come back. That's been many, many years. He might even be dead by now. But uh, James is going to teach us here early in the book why we can't give up and why these things happen. Why bad things happen to good people. Uh, I'm reminded of, a, of an illustration that I've used in sermons before that the devil had a yard sale. And people from all over came to this yard sale. He was just selling out just about everything. But there was one, there was one item there that had a sign on it, not for sale. No price. And someone asked him, why won't you, what is this? And he said, it's discouragement. And they said, well, why won't you sell that? He said, I can get more Christians into hell by discouraging them than I can with anything else. Get them to come to Christ, which he hates, but that's when he really starts to work on you. What a trophy for Satan when he can get one of God's children into hell. And for all those people that believe that can't happen, uh, read your Bibles, please. Read your Bibles. Forget about what, what that denominational preacher is telling you. And, and read and see for yourself what, what the Bible says. Uh, when was it written? Between A.D. 40 and A.D. 65. It's hard to pin down some of these dates. Uh, where was it written? Well, the, and this is, this is kind of important because it helps us when we study. There is internal evidence. That means in the book itself, in, within the book of James itself, there's internal evidence that points to it being written in Jerusalem. And we'll see some of those things as we study um, through the book of James. Any questions or comments there on the introduction? Good, because I probably wouldn't have the answers. Uh, okay, let's go right over. Let's go right over to verse. Uh, let's go right over to verse 1. I'm going to put a date up here when we started. 3, 29, 17, Milton. We'll see if we can get done with this book in less than two years. Okay. Let me read four verses. That's about as far as we'll get. <coughs> Let me just say one big excuse me right now, because <coughs> the more I talk, Jay, I saw a cough drop over here. It's just my kind. No, it's not, but I'm going to use it. No, no, I don't like water when I'm speaking. Years ago, in a speech class or something, now this might be wrong, but, but it makes sense to me. Years ago, they told us not to drink water while you were preaching or speaking because although it seems like a good idea, it flushes the natural lubrication in your throat away and it's not really help it's helping you while you're drinking it but that's about it uh, I think this is going to be a paper cough drop this is one Steve Gimmer had in his pocket so long that it sweated to the I got one mm, hate sticky you hate sticky man I get sticky on my hands and I'll lick my fingers, but usually my tongue is sticky with what I got, and it gets worse. I just got to go up and wash it. If you want to buy stock in something, buy it in hand sanitizer, because I use so much of it, you're going to make some money. 
Now, are we ready? Robert, are we still rolling? Okay. Uh, James, now this is the way he introduces himself, the greeting of the letter. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, so that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Okay, back to verse 1. When he introduces himself as James, or to the Hebrews, Jacob, he's introducing himself as a servant of God. But I just told you that James was the half-brother in the flesh to Jesus. Now, if Jesus was my brother, I might start this letter out saying, I'm James, and I want you to know, and I don't want you to ever forget. I know what I'm talking about. I'm the half-brother of Jesus, and you better listen to me. He's too humble for that. He's not a name-dropper. He's not trying to put himself above anybody. James loves the Lord, and for James, it's all about Jesus. Um, I went to a funeral at Versailles about three or four years ago, a very good friend of mine, Richard Rutledge. There were any of you there? His boys preached the funeral. He told his boys to preach the funeral. He asked them to preach his funeral. Matthew and Harold, they took turns. But they both told how their dad told them when they preached that funeral. Not to make it about him, but to make it all about Jesus. And you know, that, that has helped me. I've always known that. But just to hear that spoken, because sometimes, I know with myself, sometimes I find myself praying over a lesson, oh dear God, let me do a good job. And that's okay. But I know in my mind someplace, part of that wanting to do a good job is for Tom. <coughs> it's not what it's all about. That's Tom, the Holy Spirit's not going to work through Tom. He might use me, but he's going to work through the Word. He's working through Jesus, the living Word, the Logos. And so, whatever you do, make it all about Jesus. And if you'll do that, any ego problem that you might have, which makes you self-centered instead of God-centered, you'll get rid of that ego. You, there's no room for ego in your life. There's no room for pride in your life when you're making it all, truly all about Jesus. Why am I going to say this? Why am I going to do this? Make it about Jesus. I, I am so grateful for that, uh, for Richard telling his, his boys that. Uh, okay, so he tells us he's James and he's a servant. Now, when he says he's a servant, he's saying he is a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice what he does. In, uh, in West Virginia, we had a particular religion. And let me mention this. I might have mentioned this last week. I'm still using a lot of stuff that Carrie Allen used in that revival at Cross Plains last week. Christianity... Well, how did he say that, Mary? Christianity is not a religion. It's a way of life. If we could just remember that. 
And of naturally, it is a religion, but that's not what it's all about. It's not about all the candles in the windows and the pomp and the circumstance and the statues and uh, the, uh, the multi-complex buildings and all, all of this kind of... It's not about that. It's not, and that's, that's why we're not winning the world. It's about Jesus. It's a way of life. And when we live our lives like Jesus did, we'll see, we'll see some of the reactions like Jesus got when he was there. And it might be some of the hard reactions too, but nevertheless, it's still all about Jesus. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've done this before. When he says, Lord Jesus Christ, he's pointing out the office of Jesus. Lord Master, Jesus, Savior, Christ, Anointed One, or means the same as Messiah. So, can you imagine these people that were letting the hard times begin to get to them? Can you imagine what this did to them, what the Holy Spirit was able to work in them when they were reminded that, hey, we're, we're servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything about him probably flashed back into their minds and why they had become Christians. And listen, a lot of these people, especially the Jews, they left... They left everything behind. I personally believe the Apostle Paul left a wife behind. You became a Christian, and I think Paul was, I think there's proof that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. And if I'm not mistaken, one of the, uh, one of the qualifications to be in the Sanhedrin, you be married. I believe that she was just so much of a died in the wool Jew. She said, you're done. As far as I'm concerned, you're dead. So did the Jewish nation. They wrote you off. They, you're dead. You couldn't buy. You couldn't sell. You, they, you were just gone if you became a Christian and you had been a Jew. So they, they had a lot on the line. And so what does he tell them right off the bat? He reminds them of sweet Jesus. He reminds them of Jesus, their hero, everything that he had done for them. Uh, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, He's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, or the dispersion. There's a lot of conjecture as to why he wrote the 12 tribes. Some people say he said the 12 tribes, and so all he's writing to are the Jews, because there were 12 original Jewish tribes. I don't think so. At the time the scripture was written, right here, what did we say, A.D. 40 to uh, 65, something like that, they didn't have a whole lot of words. Uh, I might have said this here before, but I used to like to look in the, uh, the World Atlas. There was a spot in the World Atlas where they would tell you the new words from the past year. And sometimes there were quite a few of them. That's why they keep printing dictionaries, because we keep adding new words as we get astronaut. Well, they didn't have anything about astronauts back in the Bible time, but when we get them, then they tell you about them. Uh, gymnasium, uh, cafetorium. They didn't used to call it cafetorium, but they put a couple of words together because they used the cafeteria for more than a cafeteria. and. Uh, so we got a lot of new words, and I don't know how many new words we have since the Scripture was written. Millions. So because they didn't have so many words, and they wanted to be precise in what they were saying, he says 12 tribes. He speaks figuratively. 12 is what's considered a perfect Number. Right, let me put it this way. Twelve is what's considered a complete 
number. It would be perfect too, but complete describes it to us better. Twelve would be what's called a complete number. Any number divisible by twelve. 144, see why it's used in the book of Revelation. When you understand the numerology of the Bible, which is, I'm not talking any satanic stuff. I'm just saying the way the New Testament use, or Bible uses numbers. Seven, perfect. Uh, Eleven, perfect. Uh, some of them are what they call cosmic numbers. There are a lot of difference. I've got a list of them here in my Bible. Uh, and I forget some of them. That's why I got the list there. But uh, when he says to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, that being and I'm, I'm saying this not just because 12 is a, is a complete number, but I'm saying this because as you study in the book of James, it looks to me like he, he's writing even to us. I know he is. Would this complete number cover us too? Well, sure, if it's a complete number and he's talking about the, pri the, the tribes of God, it would have to cover us. So I think he's saying that, in fact, back then, the 12 tribes were the people of God. I think that's just another way here, saying the people of God. Um, to the dispersion, or the Christians run, or to the 12 tribes uh, which are scattered abroad. Uh, let me see if I got a note on that. Sin, 12 tribes, again, would be synonym for Israel. And somebody would say, well, now that's, that's just Jews. That's just Israelites. What does Paul say in Galatians? Who does he say the church is? The church is the new, the second Israel. Complete number. Old Testament Jews, New Testament Jews. Us, Old Testament church, New Testament church. I think the devil is doing that. Uh, okay. Uh, let's look at verse 2. My brethren, don't you like the way the apostles uh, use some of these uh, very personal words? My brethren. My brethren. Uh, I love to hear Mary and Mary and her sister Dorothy on the telephone. What is it you say when the, this is your, what kind of sister? Your suddenly blister. blister. And they just laugh and ca you, can, you can just tell by listening to them on the telephone. And you girls are probably the same way. They love each other and they're not ashamed to show it. There's nothing macho about James. He didn't have to be macho. He just tell them how he feels. My brethren... Or fellow Christians, the family of God through Jesus' blood. This is one thing that I like to ask people when I'm sitting around their kitchen table or in their living room with the television turned off, uh, trying to win them to Jesus. Uh, that uh, talking about being in God's family, uh, you, one night one question would be, do you think you have to be part of God's family in order to be saved? Oh yeah, I think so. Well, uh, do you think God, you need to consider God as your father? Yeah, yes I do. Well, what do fathers and children have in common? Blood. Then you ask them, are you covered by Jesus' blood? Oh yeah. When did you get covered? Oh, when I said the sinner's prayer. Show me. They can't. They can't. Now, you're being kind. You're being kind while you're doing this. Take them over to the book of Romans and show them that we were immersed into his blood. The spot, I don't know how it happened, but I know the Bible says it. We contacted the blood there. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. I read an article today. The guy said, and I happen to know that he's not a New Testament Christian. He's a, he's a Baptist. Good writer. And most things that he writes are right. But he said, we got the Holy Spirit when we were converted. Now, he was right about that. But since I happen to know that he's not a New Testament Christian, doesn't believe that baptism is for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
I know he's not talking about conversion the same way the Bible talks about conversion. Do you know that's the only place that we learn, the only, the only way we learn, the only place we learn that the Holy Spirit is living in us is when we study about it and see that it comes through our baptism. There's no other place. He doesn't say, God, how God give you the Holy Spirit? They'll tap dance all around that. And, and, and that's okay. But you be ready for them because you ought to love them and show them what God really says. Okay, my brethren. Now, why do bad things happen to good people? Who was it in the New Testament? Was it Silvanius that was sick? And Paul said, pray for him. He just about died. Tychius? Pardon? There was somebody in the New Testament. Uh, pardon? That might have been it. But one of those companions of Paul, Paul writes a letter and says, pray for him. He was so sick, he just about died. Listen, Paul was an apostle. Why didn't he miraculously heal him? Because that's not what miracles were for. Miracles were so, the word of, when somebody was speaking and they claimed it was the word of God, it could certify them as it being the word of God. When new word from God was spoken, they did the miracles to prove these were new words from God. God didn't just come down and say, oh yeah, this is mine, listen to him. No, they did this, did it all along. Uh, miracles, miracles weren't only in the New Testament, they were in the Old, and we find the same thing happening back then. But people don't study, okay? Um, my brethren, count it, and I've drawn a circle around the word all in my Bible. Count it all joy, or all of these troubles that you're going through, being persecuted about. First of all, they're from the devil. He doesn't say that, but that's where they're from. God doesn't send anything bad. Count it all joy. Or everything that happens, count it joy. I don't care what it was. Count it joy. Now, he didn't say just be happy over it. That'd be okay, but that wouldn't be as good as joy because joy is the, joy is the most euphoric thing you can get to be joyful. Be joyful. Um, count it all joy when, now notice he didn't say if, <laughs> he said when. You all remember Steve Singer, don't you? Well, one of Steve's boys took a notion he was going to be a professional bull rider, and he was. I think it was Dustin. I don't remember, but I should. I know the boys real well. But I asked Joy one time. She came to hear me preach someplace in Kentucky. I was asking her about this, and she said, Tom, I'm just so scared that he's going to get hurt sometime. I'm just so afraid if he's going to get hurt sometime. I said, Joy, it's not if he's going to get hurt. It's when he's going to get hurt. He's going to get hurt. And, she, of course, she knew that, but uh, we laughed about it. But uh, I don't think he ever did get really hurt. He's out of that now, praise God. But he says, count it all joy when you, when you do, not if you do, you're going to fall into temptation. Satan wants you. Remember 1 Peter 5.8? He, 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 he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's after Christians. He wants them. He wants them. Uh, so count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. Now, fall into implies that this is unforeseen misfortune. And it's large enough to encircle them and overwhelm them. Does that remind you of yourselves sometimes? I mean, it's, it, they, listen, Satan, Satan was a game we used to play in high school or grade school. It's called sack on or something like that. You got somebody down and then the whole crowd jumped on them. 
And uh, that's what Satan does. Satan gets you down and he's going to let every, every demon he can get in, in this field, he's going to let them sack on you. Uh, and we need to understand that. But we also need to understand greater is he that is in you, Christians, than he that is in the world. We just need to have the faith and the trust in the Lord. So my brethren counted all joy uh, or regard it as an occasion of joy when troubles come. Now that sounds stupid. <laughs> Bonnie, troubles came upon you. Are you counting it joy? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Some of this I've gone through. Later on, I thought, "You big dummy! You didn't do what God says. You didn't count that as joy." And then, but see, He's going to teach us why. Why? Well, first of all, just like James, we are servants. Servants don't get up in the morning. I wouldn't get up at all till noon if she didn't make me. <laughs> Servants don't get up in the morning and say, Well, God, I think I'll do this today. No. They say, God, what do you have for me, your servant, to do today? Maybe he says, Bonnie, I got a heart attack scheduled for you today. What you going to do with it? Are you going to glorify me through it? Are you going to show all those doctors and nurses and hospital staff and your neighbors and everybody around you that you trust me? That you're not afraid of this heart attack. You're not going to go all to pieces. Bonnie, if you'll do that, I'm going to keep making you stronger. I'm not going to take away... Your, your troubles and your trials, but Bonnie, I'm going to use them like a, like a weightlifter keeps adding weights to just keep getting stronger and stronger. And Bonnie, I'm going to make a Christian out of you that you're going to be so happy, even in the midst of your troubles, that you won't believe it. Now, see why he says, count it all joy. Uh, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. trials. Okay, uh, uh, fall into implies that this, is, that, that this unforeseen misfortune is large enough to encircle them and overwhelm them. Every time trials come, we should look for the joy that comes when we pass with flying collars. I mean, lately. I just, I can't put a finger on it. I've still got some pain, but I feel so good. Something, something's working inside me. Still have joy when this is going on. He promised to do it. He does it. And how does that make you feel? When you've been a servant of God and he's paid off. Okay, well you, when you fall into divers, now divers means various, various trials. Uh, you're persecuted because of your faith. How many of us haven't had family members turn on us because of our faith? Or friends at work. Some, some have even lost jobs. Various things. We've got it pretty easy in this country. It's, it's terrible what happens in some of these countries. You go to these Muslim-ruled countries and you see what happens to some of those Muslims if they become Christians or if Christians try to come in. <coughs> Count it all joy when your these various or these diverse temptations come upon you like when you're faced with a compromise at work. You know somebody else about three weeks ago got fired because he wouldn't go along with the boss on this and I know that's wrong. What are you going to do? You don't have any money in the bank. I'm going to give you a good, simple answer. You just do what's right. I don't care what the repercussions look like. Now, that's, 
that's pretty bold to say because it's not happening to me, it's happening to you. But isn't that what God expects out of his people? Trust him to take care of you. Uh, count it all joy. Let us see, I was given some examples. Uh, your bills pile up. You know, this might sometimes just be God's way, allowing bills to pile up. It happened to me. Allowing bills to pile up to put you on a budget and make a responsible, faithful steward out of you to use God's money. It's all his anyway, the way he tells you to. Illness comes. Divorce. God, I know you don't believe in divorce. God, why? Why? Well, he didn't set it up because God hates divorce. But he can still use it in you if you will allow him and you don't go all to pieces like Thessalonians says, like those of the world when the bad things happen. Okay, when you fall into to divers temptations, trials that test our faith that Satan will use to try to get us to fall away. We should refuse. We should refuse to add to the sinfulness of this world by going back into the world. Let's don't do it. Let's, let's make Satan roar louder. Let's not, let's not fall to him. And we can do that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You just have to believe that and practice that. Verse 3. Knowing, or here's why we count it all joy, is what he's saying. That the trying or the testing of your faith, or to see the amount of trust that you've got, that the testing of your faith, knowing that the testing of your faith worketh patience. When he says, it worketh patience, that word worketh, the E-T-H is on there. It is, it's a continual action verb. So your temptations are continuing to work or to produce patience. How about my fellow that I told you about in the very beginning that I baptized and he never came back because he got appendicitis. That didn't produce, that didn't produce any uh, patience in him at all. You're not going to have it happen with just one instance. Now, I'm not going to tell you to pray, oh, God, hit me with a tree. Uh, God, let me have an accident. Now, Bonnie, I, I'm not picking on you. I know you, all these things happen to you, but uh, stop praying for God to do them. Just accept them when he allows them to happen. Uh, so, uh, that word patience means endurance. What were these people going through? They were going through all these trials over their faith, and Satan was throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at them. They needed to be patient with God, knowing that God knows what's going on, and God can make good things come out of bad happenings, and he wants us to be strong, and I'll tell you, I want to be strong too. And it's hard sometimes when these things happen, especially sometimes when things happen with your children. Think of Job. He lost everything, even his children. They were all killed. Everything else was stolen or burned down or whatever. But he never gave up on God. And what happened? He gets more than he had to begin with. Now, whether we will get more than we had to begin with in this life, I don't know. It's okay with me. <laughs> but in the next life, there will be nothing to compare with what God has for those that endured. Revelation 2.10 Be ye faithful unto death, or endure unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He'll give us the victory. Okay?
knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience or produces patience. It's seen here as, like I said, a continuing process. It takes more than one trial to produce endurance. This isn't just putting up with a problem. It's making something good and positive come out of what would otherwise be a catastrophe. Romans 5.3 tells us that the effect uh, Romans 5.3 the, the effect of bearing our trials rightfully rightly is strength to bear more and even harder battles to come. Facing trials automatically produces endurance or inner strength. They must be faced with a positive attitude. Count it all joy. What is the old saying? If life hands you a lemon, make lemonade. Life can and this, I love this. Uh, I've forgotten that I put this in James. I keep this written in a couple of Bibles that I carry sometimes. Just listen closely to this. Life can only do to you what life finds in you. You become strong enough through these various trials. Life is not going to hurt you. Oh, it's going to waylay you. It's going to put speed bumps out there and all of this. But it can't ruin your... The biggest thing in your life, the most important thing would be, now that I'm a Christian, I'm going to stay a Christian. And listen, it's not always easy because of these things that James is talking about come to pass. He wants us to get ready. What's, what's the old saying? Forewarned is forearmed. We're ready. We're ready. Uh... Shouldn't we start pumping the iron of counting it all joy now? I want to be ready for the next time. I want to be ready for the next time. Uh, I know this works. I know it works. Uh, I know it has to. I talked about that illustration with Satan and discouragement. This has to discourage Satan when Christians take this to heart and they say, I'm not going to let him get me down. I'm going to use what he does to me or what God allows to happen to me. I'm going to use that to get stronger. Shouting time in heaven, a sinner once lost is found. It's shouting time.